can continue and and b- before uh, Professor Hugh Spitzer uh, start the uh, the lecture t- uh, later, uh, can you ask again uh, whether Mr. Dean is already here? Okay, while 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 waiting for the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia. Um, yeah. Good morning, participants. Um, yeah. I know. Just is... let me uh, let me open, and then I will give it to you. Okay. Because... Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you all a very good morning, and welcome to the online Studium Generale on the U.S. election organized by the Department of Constitutional Law, Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia. As the moderator of this event, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Nofrizal Bahar. I am a member of teaching team of the Department of Constitutional Law, Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia. Today, I am accompanied by a colleague of mine from the Department of Procedural Law, Mr. Aristo Pangeribuan, who is now doing his PhD program at the Law School of University of Washington in Seattle, the United States of America, where our two distinguished guest professors teach some law courses. Ariso is doing his dissertation under the supervision of Professor Hugh Spitzer. Good morning, Aristo. Good morning, Bang Nofrizal. Yeah, because of Aristo, okay. I could successfully invite our honorable guest lecturers, Professor Hugh Spitzer and Professor Lisa Mannheim, who will shortly explain to all of us the election system of the United States. And hereby, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Spitzer and Professor Mainheim. We are very honored and happy to have you, even though it is just virtually. Thank you very much for your kind willingness to spend your time with us today, although it is now already late in the afternoon in Seattle. For the audience's information, it's still Friday at 5 p.m. in Washington State, America. We highly appreciate this opportunity as well as we all know today, almost everyone on this planet is waiting for the official result of the US election. And since the beginning of this month, we have paid a lot of attention on this one of the biggest democratic processes in the world. Distinguished professors and audiences, this Studium Generale is not only attended by the students of our faculty, but also by other interested parties from all over the country. Ladies and gentlemen, before starting the lecture, uh, actually we uh, have scheduled for the Dean to give uh, his address. Uh, Mr. Dean, uh, are you already here? Dr. Edmond Makari? Okay, uh, he's not here yet. He's here. I, yeah? I can see him. Yeah, but uh, he, he didn't reply my... Maybe Aristo will, we can call him later. I think okay. he has his, his uh, he, 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 you can't hear him. He has his uh, microphone off. Oh, oh. yeah. Pada kan microphone-nya boleh di unmute. Okay. Okay, Aristo, I think here you can now start by introduce, uh, introducing uh, Professor Hugh Spitzer and Professor uh, Lisa Mehan, maybe by reading his uh, their uh, brief biographies. Uh, Aristo, now uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bang Norvizal. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor Spitzer. So um, we are lucky today, as Bang Norvizal has told us, um, I know that it's a bit early in the morning, but the early risers gets the worm. So now we will get the worm, the lectures from uh, Professor Spitzer. He is a University of Washington Law School professor um, teaching several public law courses, federal, state, and local uh, government. Um, he has so many publications, issues on federalism, and uh, Professor Spitzer earned his BA from Yale University, which is the uh, top university in the United States, and his JD, the Juris Doctor from the University of Washington Law School, and his LLM from uh, uh, Berkeley. Could, could you mute? Uh, okay, got it. 
And then um, Professor Lisa Menheim, which will be joining us later, uh, also an expert in the constitutional law, election law, and presidential powers. She earned her BA from Yale and her JD from Yale Law School. And uh, she is also a, a managing editor uh, for the Yale Law Journal. So, uh, Professor Switzer, now the U.S. Uh, election, the U.S. politics, it's, it's heating right now. And many commentators in Indonesia, even as far as argue that now the U.S. political situation, just like Indonesia in 2019, where the losing candidate, they they um, uh, did not admit, they don't admit they don't admit uh, their loss, and then also um, see the the election system also confuse us. How come the 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 ones that in Indonesia, America, we we look up to the America when when we are talking about democracy, but the election system is a bit confusing. So um, could you start from the beginning? Just um, tell us how the election system works, what, because sometimes we hear that uh, the, 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 the presidential candidate that gets more popular vote, they don't automatically be the president. Please, Professor Spitzer, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today. Good morning. And it's great to see so many people up and, uh, and uh, in this uh, gathering today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're honored to have many, uh, many people from Indonesia who come to our law school at the University of Washington in Seattle to uh, earn LLMs and PhDs. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, really many people who have come. I, I hope that some of you will consider it too. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased to be able to talk with you today, even though it is only virtual. Someday I will be able to come in person, I hope. So I'm going to talk, and Professor Mannheim will join me later, uh, about the election system in the United States, uh, and particularly the election system for president. And uh, I'll go through some history and then try to, so that I, I can explain how our system has developed in the context of history and constitutional history in the United States. Uh, so I will put up a screen here. Uh, hopefully you can see it. Let me know if you can't. Uh, and, uh, and we'll start. Uh, I put up this very strange looking map of the United States because, as I'll explain later, this map shows how many electoral college votes each of the uh, parties uh, candidates have earned and, and how many votes each, well, it just shows how many votes each state has. And California on the left has the largest number of electoral college votes. It does have the largest population. But as you will see in my talk, a lot of the very small states with very small populations have more weight, have more votes than their population uh, justifies. And it all goes back to 1787, when uh, the American Constitution was written. Uh, we had been through a, uh, a revolutionary war uh, against uh, Great Britain and seceded from the United Kingdom at, and formed, of course, uh, a separate country. But originally, the United States was really 13 separate countries, 13 very little countries, actually some little and some big. 
Uh, and so uh, although they joined in order to separate from uh, Great Britain, from England, they really saw themselves as each state being a separate state under international law and a separate little country. New York was a little state, a little country. Virginia was a little country. Massachusetts was a little country. And they came together in a, uh, through a confederation and they signed what was called the Articles of Confederation, which was a fairly loose national government where the national government was responsible for foreign affairs and defense and not very much else. And it, it did not work very well because there were problems of, uh, there were trade barriers between the different states. So very quickly, even though the, the, the war ended in 1783, just, uh, just a few years later in 1787, there was a convention that developed a new constitution. In the old confederation, each state had one vote, one and only one vote. In the new convention, they were trying to put together a much stronger unified country, but they decided to do it as a, a continue as a federation. The delegates from the state of Virginia with the largest number of people, the biggest population, they proposed a national government with two houses of parliament or Congress and one house with uh, entirely elected uh, by the people in proportion to population and the second house chosen by the first house. So that the country would be dominated by uh, the, the states with the large populations. The small states proposed a different plan with just one house of Congress, one house of parliament, with one vote per state, because they were afraid of the, the states with the big population. And they came up with a compromise, it known as the Connecticut Compromise, where there would be two houses in Congress. The House of Representatives is based on population. And the Senate has two members from each state. And so the impact of this system was to give disproportionate power to the smaller states through the Senate. And the Constitution says that uh, each state must be guaranteed the same number of votes, two votes in the Senate. So the Senate is inherently undemocratic. And uh, people have argued about this for many years, except that the constitution is very difficult to amend. To amend the constitution, it takes a two thirds vote of each house and then three quarters, three fourths of the states must approve the amendment. And of course the small states do not want to give up power in the Senate. So here's a summary. The House of Representatives has, has uh, uh, representatives allocated by population and the representatives serve for two years. So California with 39 and a half million people has 53 representatives in this house. The Senate though, each state has two senators. They have six year terms. They all have equal votes. And California has only two senators. My state, Washington has two senators. It's a medium sized state. And Wyoming with the same population as my city, Seattle, has two senators in the United States Senate. 
So that's the system we have. Now, I'll explain why it makes a difference in the electoral college, because the Constitution also says that the president is chosen not by a vote of the people of the country, but the president is chosen by the electoral college. When the Constitution was written in the late 18th century, the people who wrote it, they were all men. They were all English and German people, Scottish. They were all rich. They all had lots of property. So they were upper class or upper middle class people. They were very worried about democracy. They wanted individual liberty. They wanted to be independent from Great Britain. They did not really want democracy in most of the states. In fact, in some states, only six or 7% of the population could vote. In other states, like Pennsylvania, it was probably 40% or half of all the men could vote. So it all depended on the states. It's also important to realize the states had and continue to have a great deal of power in terms of control over everybody's lives. The national government was meant to be a limited government, only doing foreign affairs, defense, the money supply, uh, the post office, uh, and trade trade within the states and trade and, and relations with the uh, indigenous people, the Indians. And, and people did not think the national government would have very much power, so they didn't worry about the Senate being disproportionate and undemocratic. And on the electoral college, each state gets a number of electoral college delegates every four years to choose the president based on the number of representatives and the number of senators. So California has 53 plus two, it has 55 votes in the electoral college. That is a lot. Wyoming has three, it has one representative and two senators. Alaska has three. So each state picks a number of electoral college members equal to the number of representatives and senators in the National Congress. And this explains why in some years we have elected presidents who do not have a majority of the popular vote. So again, here uh, on election day, uh, the voters in the country chose 538 electors or delegates to the electoral college. And uh, every state had has two based on the number of senators. And then the other 435 is based on population. And then Washington DC has three. The electoral college will meet in December and vote on the president, they choose the president who then takes office on January the 20th. Now, um, if the electoral college cannot agree on a president, then it goes to the House of Representatives and they vote by one vote per state to choose a president. So each state has one vote. California has one vote. Wyoming has one vote. And as it happens in a majority of states, especially the small population states, they have representatives who are Republicans. So if it goes to the House of Representatives, then Mr. Trump would be elected. But this has only happened once, only once in the history of the United States. Sorry, Professor Spitzer. Yes. For moving forward. So yes. um, this is interesting. How are these electors are chosen? Yes. I mean, I mean yes. the people is choosing the, you 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 say that the people 
voting for the electors. And right. then the question is how, mm -hmm. how they are chosen. Why? <clears throat> yeah. So the Do they system. Know? Do the reporters know about the yeah. electors? Yeah. The system for choosing the electors is up to each state. For in the early years, some electors were chosen by the legislatures, but very soon by the mid 19th century, they went to the system we have today. Each party proposes in each state, each party proposes a group, a slate of electors. And for example, I was reading the Michigan state law today about uh, choosing electors. And under Michigan law, it says, when a voter votes for president and they vote for Biden or for Trump, they are actually voting for the Democratic group of electors or the Republican group of electors or the Socialist Workers Party group of electors, but they never get enough votes to go anywhere. In some years, there have been minor parties that have taken away votes. Four years ago, the Green Party took away enough votes from Hillary Clinton to make her lose in Pennsylvania and Michigan and I think Wisconsin. And perhaps that's why she lost the election. But this year, the, the voters voted for groups of electors in each state and you can see that uh, the blue states had enough uh, you know, electors to add up to 306 members of the electoral college. It requires only 270 votes to win. And so President-elect President Biden has 306 electors who have who are required by state laws to vote for him and only 232 are committed to trump and uh what trump is trying to do and we'll talk about this a little later but he's he he uh, is what we call a sore loser he's a bad loser and he's trying somehow to confuse things and to mess them up so that it will not, the electoral college will not be able to vote or the electoral college will not be able to do its job. Almost everybody thinks that his efforts will be unsuccessful and that the, the, the election will go ahead and of course, Biden will become the president. Uh, but you never know with Mr. Trump, he's very uh, difficult to predict. <laughs> one, one, more, one more question, because uh, in the chat box, because it's related to electoral uh, college. So mm -hmm. um, it's a um, question from Abraham Nugroho. Uh, he said that, how about faithless electors? We know that in some states, there is no obligation to follow your pledge. And even in some states, it's just a misdemeanor, not a crime. Right. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. In Washington state, if the member of the electoral college uh, uh, does not follow his or her responsibility, there's, they are fined. And that case went to the Supreme Court this year and our Supreme Court ruled that the state laws controlling the electors uh, are constitutional and remain in effect. Now, most, of, in fact, virtually all of the electors are active party members. So it's very unlikely that, e that enough electors for Biden would change their minds. They are committed uh, party members for the Democratic Party. So this is not likely to happen. 
but it happened before, right? In the in, well, in the last election, a, a small number of Democratic electors tried to vote for uh, some compromise type candidates in order to try to get some of the Republicans to change their minds, some of the Republican electors. And none of them did that. And the I think there were four or six Democratic electors who voted for somebody else other than Hillary Clinton. And they were all disciplined for this. And the Supreme Court said that this was OK. Uh, one thing to, be, to, to just note is that you have to look at each state when you're you're adding up the votes to see what is happening. On the top is, uh, is Georgia, which much to, to uh, Mr. Trump's surprise, voted for Biden. But the votes for Biden were mostly in the urban areas around the big cities uh, and the suburban areas, Savannah and Atlanta, and the same in Michigan down below where Detroit, went heavily uh, for Biden and the other urban areas. And in general, the, the more rural areas tend to vote Republican, the more urban areas tend to vote Democratic. Now, I, I wanna say something else, uh, uh, actually about the electoral college. Uh, there were these years in which, a few years where because the Electoral College has at least, you know, every state has at least three votes, even the little tiny states. And in a few years, there, uh, the, uh, the, the person who got the smaller number of popular votes still became president. It happened once in 1824, where John Quincy Adams was elected president. He had only 31.5% and Jackson had 42, but, it, but there were small party candidates and broke it up and it went to the House of Representatives and they voted for Adams. In 1876, uh, a man named Samuel Tilden got just over, he got 51%, but he did not become president. It went to a special commission because of disputes over votes and there was a deal cut between the two parties. And they agreed to have the Republican Hayes become president. Uh, but then they, they agreed to uh, take federal troops out of the South. This was after the Civil War. It was a very complicated deal. In 1888, uh, Cleveland got a majority of votes, but uh, Harrison uh, had a majority of the electors, the same with George W. Bush in 2000 and then Trump. Trump in 2016 got, uh, I think four million fewer votes than Hillary Clinton and he's still, or maybe two million, he still became president. So we are stuck in, the, in America with an 18th century constitution and an 18th century system of electing the president. And as I said before, one of the reasons that we have this system is nobody in 1787 worried so much because the American government was not supposed to do very much. The national government wasn't supposed to do much. And it was mostly uh, the state governments that were providing services and, and, and doing things. And, uh, and the states ex exercised most governmental powers. Uh, the federal government, the national government still was just doing foreign affairs, defense, Indian tribes, expansion of the land, postal service, and money. Uh, it had very little taxing power. It had a very small number of employees. And then, uh, and, and it also, uh, uh, during the 19th century, encouraged railroads across the country. The country was expanding physically, as you see in this map. The original colonies on the right, those are the first states. And then in 1783 
at the end of the civil, I'm sorry, the Revolutionary War, uh, America received the pink part of the country, although much of it was disputed for a number of years with Britain. In 1803, uh, the United States purchased a very large piece of land from France, the Louisiana Purchase. And then uh, the United States invaded Mexico in 1848 and Texas became a state and then the United States seized California. And they also worked out an arrangement with Great Britain for Oregon, which included my state, Washington in 1846. And then uh, Hawaii was taken from, it was an independent country and it was seized in 1898, Alaska, 1867. So the United States expanded but as you see here, uh, the American government was very small all the way through the 19th century. And then it went up rapidly in the 20th century, particularly uh, uh, as, uh, uh, be because of the depression in the 1930s people were demanding that the national government do something to improve the economy. So we had public works programs. We instituted social security for, uh, for older people and a, a large number of programs. The states actually started doing more too, but the government expanded. And then during the second world war, of course, there was a huge expansion in the government and it has only gone up since then. Much bigger. Also, we have, of course, change in communication and in transportation. So the United States has become much more a single country, a very big country, over the last 200 years, and particularly in the last 100 years. But we still have, in the 21st century, we have a, an 18th century constitution. And uh, so that's important to remember. And here's the other thing to remember about our electoral system is that the, under our old constitution, which is so hard to change, the control of elections is at the state level. There's a picture in, at the top of this screen of the way that they used to vote uh, through much of the 19th century, where the men and only men were voting. And in much of the country, only white men were voting. Uh, 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 citizens who were uh, African American or Asian American uh, could only vote in some states like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. But the men would vote, they'd all come together and one by one, they would go in front of the election officer and declare their votes publicly. And of course, everybody in the community knew how everybody voted. And we did not get the secret ballot, which is shown below in the second picture that was started in Australia. We didn't get that until the late 19th and early 20th century and it happened state by state. There were other important changes, of course, uh, over time. First, uh, the freed slaves, African-Americans, got the vote in the 1860s, but then it was suppressed in much of the South, in the Southern states, uh, after the federal troops left the South after the Civil War. And, uh, even though they were guaranteed by the constitution, the right to vote, um, the national government ignored it and did nothing really to protect it. Uh, and women did not get the vote uh, until nationwide until 1920. Before that, a number of states, uh, starting with Wyoming, interestingly, the, some of the states gave women the right to vote. Uh, but again, it's the states that control the voting systems and who gets to vote. 
uh, although now we do have, for instance, a constitutional amendment, really the last constitutional amendment that made a huge change politically. And that was 100 years ago when women were guaranteed the right to vote nationwide. In my state, uh, our state in Washington, interestingly, when our state was formed in 1889, women had the vote only for school elections because they were seen as being responsible for children. They let, let the men vote too. Maybe they should have only let the women vote, but both voted, but only the men voted for state officers and for electors for president. Uh, and again, we still have control of the elections and the systems of the elections in each state driven by state laws. And it varies uh, from state to state. In some states, in order to vote, you have to show your identification card. In other states, you don't. In some states, people vote in person. In our state, in Washington and in Oregon next door and in Utah, I think, everybody votes by mail. Completely, it saves a lot of money. People fill out the uh, the ballot. They put it in a special envelope. They sign the outside. Every signature is double checked when the ballots come in, and then they are stacked up in the computers. And at eight o'clock in the F in the evening on election day in our state, uh, the election officials push the button, and it it tabulates all of the votes very quickly, but you have to go to each system. And when it comes to the electoral college in most of the states, uh, it's uh, the, the electors are chosen based on who gets the highest number of votes. That's called first past the post. But in Maine and in, uh, in uh, Nebraska, I think uh, they, they vote for national electors by congressional district. So in each of those states, uh, in Maine, there was one Republican elector and in Nebraska, one Democratic elector with the rest of the state going the other way. The point is the systems of voting, the requirements for voting are different in every state. In some states, they did not begin to count the absentee ballots or the mail-in ballots. They had some until the polls were closed. In our state, they actually uh, run them through the machines, but they don't tabulate the results until eight o'clock in the evening. So it's different everywhere, which is one reason that we have lawsuits in different states about different kinds of issues. Um, the good news is that throughout our country, the people who are responsible for running the elections are very, very honest. They are very committed to doing things correctly. Everything happens in the open. And don't believe Mr. Trump or his lawyer, Mr. Giuliani, when they say that, that, uh, they wouldn't, in Michigan, they would not let the party representatives watch the uh, tabulation of the votes or watch the voting. Those are lies. It's very open. And we have a very interesting situation where we have Republican secretaries of state in the different states. In most states, the secretary of state is responsible for election systems. And the re even Republican secretaries of state are insisting that everything is happening fairly and correctly and that there's no fraud anywhere in the country. So uh, and then the secretary of state of Georgia has been criticized because he's a Republican. And, and some of his colleagues in his party are saying, you should, you should declare that there's fraud, and he's, he's an engineer by trade, and he's conservative Republican, but he says, I'm sorry, my job is to ensure 
that the elections are fair, this is a fair election. In our state, Washington, our Secretary of State uh, is a Republican and she is widely trusted and she's completely committed to fair elections. So we're lucky to have election officials both in the states and in the counties where in each county they're counting votes. Uh, they're quite honest. I'm going to say just one thing about a, a case, a law case that's sort of interesting. Back in 1961, we had a national case from Tennessee uh, that went to the Supreme Court. And in the states, they used to have a system where in many states, including California and Washington and Oregon and Tennessee, where the Senates were composed based on counties and the, the House of Representatives was by population. So you had, again, the rural counties controlling many states. And the United States Supreme Court said that this was a violation of the, our 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equal protection of the laws and required that each person have one equal vote. So our state governments are all very democratic in uh, how they are chosen, how the, the uh, legislatures are chosen, whether they have two houses or one house. Uh, one state, Nebraska, has a single house, but but the national government still has a Senate that's not democratically elected because every state it, they're democratic elected within each state, but some states have more power than others. Uh, it's just ironic. Uh, one other question I was asked to. Uh, to touch on uh, was why in the United States we have only two parties, uh, two political parties, and we don't have uh, uh, minor parties of any importance. And this has always been the case, at least since the 1800 election, uh, when the country split <clears throat> into two parties, then they were called the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party, uh, actually technically called the Republican Party, but it is the forerunner of today's liberal Democratic Party. The Federalists were essentially the forerunner of the, today's Republican Party. We had just two parties and that is, a, and, and there were only a few elections where minor parties made a difference uh, one of them was in 1860, when the country was about to collapse into a civil war. And there were four, essentially four parties. Uh, the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln was elected. And the Democratic Party broke into three pieces. Uh, and that helped Lincoln get elected. Another uh, situation was in 1912 when the Republican Party broke in two and there was the kind of mainstream conservative Republican Party and then there was the progressive Republican Party uh, whose candidate was a former president, Theodore Roosevelt. And that enabled the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, to be elected. But the basic reason that we continue to have two parties, even though both parties have really distinct wings. The Democratic Party has a moderate wing and a left wing. The Republican Party has a moderate wing and an ultra conservative wing. And so in if we had a proportional representation system for electing Congress or parliament, we would have four parties. Uh, in, yeah, um, you mentioned about the left wing and the right wing. Maybe yeah. in your Indonesia, we're not familiar with the spectrum. Oh, Could you elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. So 
so uh, uh, left wing, and this comes from originally from the French parliament, the French National Assembly, where the progressive, uh, uh, more liberal delegates <clears throat> to the National Assembly sat on the left and the conservatives sat on the right. And so we say progressive and liberal is left wing, conservative and reactionary is right wing. And the Republican is more right wing, the Democratic Party is more progressive, more left wing. Uh, there is a French political, was a professional, uh, sorry, a French political scientist, uh, uh, Michel Duverger, who uh, came up with a very good theory that explains why we have only two parties in the United States. Uh, and that is because in our, in our system, as well as the English or the United Kingdom system, the candidate with, uh, who is first, who has the highest number of votes, even if it is not a majority, that candidate goes to parliament in, in the United Kingdom or goes to Congress in most states in America. In some states, Louisiana, Georgia, for example, they have runoffs so that someone will get a, a majority. But in most states, it's whichever candidate gets the largest number of votes and the same for the electors, whichever elector group gets the largest number of votes, they go to the electoral college. And he said, this is a French political scientist, that this really, forces in everybody into big political parties. They cover, they're called big tent, all within one big tent. Uh, they have political parties with people with very different views. If you have a proportional representation system where each party, at least that gets a certain amount, say 15%, as in uh, Sweden, uh, they get some delegates to the, the parliament. Uh, this encourages small parties. Israel is like that. Uh, uh, Germany is like that in one house. Um, so, uh, and I can't remember in Indonesia how that works, <laughs> uh, uh, but you can tell me. But here's Duverger's uh, explanation that the, the one with the, the, the most votes is winner takes all. And the loser gets nothing. I'm on the right here. And so people don't want to vote for small parties because they think they will waste their vote. So the minors parties do not get very many votes. And we have two parties. Uh, we also have a system of primaries. Uh, and I'm getting to the end of my segment here. Um, uh, Professor Mannheim, are you here? Yes, he's here. Good, okay, uh, I'm almost done. In, in our, our system, when each of the parties is picking its candidates, they are in, in most, all, uh, throughout the country really, uh, the, and this is something from what was called our progressive era, about 110 years ago, people ch made changes throughout the country in, many, in most states so that the voters actually get to vote on who the candidates are within each party. Uh, in, even though the parties can set rules, certain rules about who can vote in their primary elections, they tend to be very open to mostly to party members uh, or people who declare that they support a party. And so people do vote for the candidates within each party, even if they aren't really active in the party. And, uh, and those are the ones who then go on to the general elections. So um, I'm going to ask Professor Mannheim to uh, talk a little bit about the election this year. You see a very unhappy Mr. Trump on the top, a very happy President-elect Biden on the bottom. And uh, uh, nevertheless, we are seeing these... Uh, these challenges to the election in the key so-called battleground states, 
the ones that uh, that were uh, close, somewhat close in the voting that, that Mr. Biden won. And so Mr. Trump and some of his party are working very hard to somehow, somehow try to challenge this. And Professor Mannheim will say something about the kinds of challenges that we saw before the election, during the election itself, and then today. Uh, go ahead, Professor Mannheim. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks so much for the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Um, so as Professor Spitzer has been uh, discussing, in the United States, we have our elections primarily run by our state governments, not by our federal government. Um, and within each state, we have three branches of government. We have the legislative branch, we have the executive branch, and then we have the judicial branch. When it comes to how these states run elections, um, the way it primarily works is that the legislature creates the laws, the election related laws that govern these elections within each state. And then the executive branch, which includes things, um, for example, um, uh, officials who are called secretaries of state within a given state. So you'll have the California secretary of state, for example. Um, we have those uh, largely elected officials in charge of then executing the legislature's election laws. Um, and so I, I said that they're largely elected officials, but actually um, only the sort of uh, top um, election related officials within each state are themselves elected. Um, below that, we have any number, you know, really across the country, thousands of people who work to help um, execute and, and basically administer the laws that are passed by the legislatures. So that's how elections are run within each state. There's not really an obvious role for each state's judicial branch to play. However, over time, um, candidates and people interested in voting rights and the like have brought more and more of their disputes into the court systems in an effort to basically uh, raise arguments like the following. They might say, um, the legislature has passed these election laws, but those election laws are inconsistent with the state's constitution. Or maybe they say those election laws are inconsistent with the federal constitution. And so they bring those claims in the courts. Um, likewise, people might go into the courts and say, you know, these uh, secretaries of state or these election workers, they are um, implementing these election laws in ways that violate the election laws themselves. They're not doing it in the way the legislature is making them, you know, wants them to do it. And so people may bring claims into the courts to try to force these executive branch officials to um, administer the laws in a different way. So that's all occurring within a state government. On top of that, you have people going into the judicial branch of the federal government and also trying to bring claims there. If somebody brings an election related claim in a federal court, so now again, the states are the ones that are largely running these elections, right? And so if you wanna take it in a sense out of the state system and bring it into a federal court, um, the, the range of claims that you can bring within that federal court is it's pretty narrow, okay? So most of the election related challenges that we see occur in the state system, state courts, um, but some of them do, for various reasons, make their way into the federal court system. Um, and theoretically, those could go all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. So what we've seen in this election cycle is um, if we look at the three phases that Professor Spitzer referred to, um, with respect to the first phase, what the, the challenges that were brought before election day, um, there were a large number of challenges uh, across the country, hundreds of challenges. The, the, at the end of the day, I think the number of challenges, at least by one um, source that was tracking it, were um, over 300 challenges were brought in the court systems uh, before election day this cycle. A lot of these challenges were responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and essentially what people were raising were challenges like the following. Um, Pennsylvania's laws say that we should run an election this way. But Pennsylvania's legislature passed those laws before the pandemic. Now that we have all these pandemic related challenges that we're all facing, it would violate the Pennsylvania constitution for us to keep using those same legislative laws. Therefore court, can you please intervene here and force the state to run the election a different way in light of the pandemic. Um, so those sorts of uh, challenges we were seeing before election day 
Um, and it's hard to summarize the outcomes of those because there were so many, but essentially at the state level, um, with when, when they were being brought in, when people were bringing those claims in the state courts, they sort of had a mixed record in terms of whether they, they were able to force the states to change or not. But when people were bringing those in the federal courts, for the most part, the federal courts were refusing to intervene. So they were refusing to get involved. Um, so that's all before the election occurred this year. On election day, um, it was really interesting. So um, a bunch of us, for example, were sort of on call on election day, sort of waiting for things to arise, the sorts of claims that may arise on election day. Maybe you have um, a big problem in a given state, um, some sort of software isn't working, or maybe the, the lines for people waiting to vote are six hours long, or there's some other problem that's occurring on election day. Um, and so what can happen is that people can rush into a courthouse on election day and say, we need emergency, you to in, intervene in this emergency posture because we need you to force this voting uh, location to stay open um, uh, for extra hours or something like that. But here's the thing, on election day, there really wasn't much that went on that was a problem. The 2020 election in the United States was extraordinarily well run um, with respect to how people actually were casting their ballots, um, how the ballots were being received and organized and then counted. Um, it's been a huge success, which goes to, among other things, um, the hard work of those thousands of people across the country, number one. Um, and then number two, uh, it, it goes to the, uh, frankly, the extraordinary effort that a lot of voters put in this election cycle to be able to cast their votes, uh, notwithstanding the pandemics associated with the, cha with the uh, sorry, the challenges associated with the pandemic. All right, so then that gets us then to the third phase, which is post-election day. And these claims are fundamentally different from the claims that come before election day. And the reason why is we're no longer talking about the conditions of voting in the same way. Now we are instead talking about how are, do we have to count the ballots? What are the laws governing how these ballots have to be counted? Um, Okay, so what about all the claims that have come after election day? Um, one way to summarize the claims, the, the, the lawsuits and the legal claims that have been advanced um, by uh, President Trump and his um, campaign after election day, um, they are no good. They are no good as a matter of law. They, there's a reason why um, the lawsuits have not changed anything in a meaningful way. Um, the reason why is because they, from what we've seen so far, they pretty clearly all fail as a matter of law. And if you want to look at why they are all failing, um, you can kind of think about them as falling in, as a, having at least one of the three following problems. Um, and the three problems are either they're not actually a claim. It's not a legal claim, number one. Number two, there's no evidence to back it up. Number three, even if it's a legal claim and even if there's evidence to back it up, the um, error that the, that the litigants have identified is so small that it can't possibly make a difference in the actual election result. So if you go through the many different claims that have been advanced, and we can talk about some of them if it's helpful, um, basically every single one that we've seen, and I think we're looking at you know, dozens, dozens have been filed. This is unprecedented, this level of litigation. But every single case fails for at least one of those three reasons. Um, so Professor Spitzer, would you, should I sort of take questions or do you want me to keep talking or what, what would be the best way of handling things? Um, Professor Manheim. So yeah. um, I'm Aristo. So um, why, why do you think that there is no, there is no evidence uh, for the uh, <laughs> Are you saying that because you're living in Washington because Washington is blue or, I mean, why? Great, I mean, that's a great question. No, I'm just joking. Is his move <laughs> unprecedented in the U.S. presidential election? So could you so, elaborate more on that? Absolutely. So the legal claims are not unprecedented. The sort of the, what's going on legally right now, in a sense, is very boring um, again, because uh, President Trump is not the first person to bring a frivolous lawsuit. Fri people bring frivolous lawsuits all the time. And the courts- That is, have that is lawsuits without any merit. Yes. So if, um, and, and again, I'm-
here's the thing. I'm talking about real basics here. So to win a lawsuit, you need to have a legal claim. And by that, I just mean you need to have a theory that actually finds some sort of source in the law. So if you want to ar argue something like, you know, uh, 10,000 ballots in Nevada were cast by voters who are not eligible to vote, that's a legal claim. There is some basis in law for that, for that, for that argument. If you want to say broadly, um, you know, in an all caps tweet on Twitter, if you want to say the election is stolen, um, this is a conspiracy, exclamation point, that's not a legal claim. It's not, it is not something that the courts have any ability or frankly desire, but any ability to do anything with. It has to be translated into a legal claim. So once we're in the world where we take all of these different arguments and claims and allegations and translate them into something that a court is able to look at, that's where you have one, at least one of the two pro following problems. Number one, when it actually comes to a, 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 a something that a court is able to look at, right? Like a filing that a court is able to look at, either there's no evidence or the claim is so minor that it can't possibly make a difference. And so, um, and, and it's a good question. I'm saying this because I personally want one person or the other to take off the, take the, take over the presidency in January. Um, let me put it this way, regardless of my own personal political preferences, what I'm saying is just objectively correct. And if you um, sort of look to the uh, various people with expertise in these areas in the United States, um, they will all tell you the same thing, number one. And number two, if you look to what the courts have done with all of these claims so far, you'll also see the same thing there. Um, I think at this point, there's been something like two dozen cases resolved by the courts, and some of those are going up on appeals now, of those two dozen cases, every single, um, uh, yeah, two dozen cases, every single one of them falls into one of these categories I'm talking about. Um, most of them, the, the courts, you know, the vast majority of them, maybe all but one of, or two of them, the court simply dismissed the, the claim and because it wasn't, it, it, did, it was not constructed in a way that the um, person who brought it here, the Trump campaign, could possibly get meaningful relief. So the, the court just dismissed it. Um, in the one or two cases, uh, depending if you count appeals and like, um, that the Trump uh, campaign has actually won, again, the stakes were so small that it doesn't make a difference. So um, let me give you an example of that. When I say it doesn't make a difference, what do I mean? Um, there's currently a case that's still pending before the United States Supreme Court over how um, the US Constitution requires Pennsylvania to count its ballots. And the gist of what happened there was that in the pre-election um, day pandemic related litigation, courts, uh, the state courts reached a certain result about accommodations that had to be given to voters, right? And then again, there's still a pending controversy between, before the United States Supreme Court over whether what those courts did, those state courts did, whether that was um, consistent with the US constitution. So I don't know if you're following this or not, but it doesn't matter, and here's why. However the US Supreme Court resolves that case can't possibly change the outcome of the election. Um, in Pennsylvania, the margin right now is over 45,000 vote, votes separating the two candidates. At most, the number of ballots that could be affected by this um, uh, US Supreme Court ruling would be a few thousand at most. So even if every single one of those ballots went for one candidate or the other, which of course they won't, but even if they did, it couldn't possibly affect the result. So that's an example, you. sorry, that's an example of where the, the stakes aren't big enough to make a difference. So uh, yeah, let, me, let me say two other things. Number one, many of the lawyers who were representing and have been representing Trump and the Republicans in these cases, or have been asked to represent them, have declined or have dropped out. And that is because we have court rules that and, and ethics rules that state that lawyers must, when they file a case, I'm sure you have the same rule, that you must believe that there is a reasonable legal basis 
and it is probable that some evidence can be found to back the case that is filed. And lawyers can be sanctioned if they violate that rule. So most respectable lawyers will not represent Mr. Trump. So the second thing is, what is he doing? Why is he doing this? I think the best ex explanation is that he is very angry and he's very unhappy. Uh, and he, he, he is a very strange person and he's not able ever to admit defeat. Uh, it, now, maybe he has a strategy. Maybe he's hoping it will help his party win in the next election, or maybe he'll come back. We don't know. Uh, personally, I think it's because he's just a very strange individual. So maybe a few more questions, if there are some. Yeah, yeah. So uh, why, why I'm asking that? Because... Trump actually has many supporters in Indonesia. He has a business here in Indonesia. That's why. That's why. Sorry, Professor Manson. I'm just asking, are you saying that because Washington is blue? It's just for, I mean, the sake of, um, um, you know, giving clarification. Because many, I think uh, we believe there are few people here are Trump supporters, even though they are Indonesians. And um, about... This is also a question from um, from the chat box from Maudi. So, what's if 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 it's a claim uh, if if uh, there's no evidence for his claim? What his end game? Can you predict what his end game? I mean, um, could you tell us? Could you uh, your opinion about it? Yeah, Lisa, what do you think? <laughs> it's weird. Um. So. Uh... President Trump, and by the way, uh, in terms of support for President Trump, look, um, 70 million people voted plus, more than 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. There are a lot of Americans who also uh, would like uh, President Trump to stay in office. Um, there are, however, more people who voted um, and people who voted within the sort of relevant states in light of the electoral college, um, there are more people who voted for uh, Joe Biden to become president. So it's not the case that, um, uh, how can I say this? In every election in the United States, we've had some people want one person to be in office and we want an, uh, and other people have wanted other people to be in office. This is not the first disputed election. We have laws in place. We have processes in place. Um, and by the way, in terms of those laws we have, the president of the United States, the sitting president of the United States has no official role to play at all. It doesn't matter as a matter of law if he agrees with the outcome. It doesn't matter if he concedes. It doesn't matter if he declares victory. Um, again, as a matter of law, it's just not relevant. Um, so if the question is then, why is President Trump not conceding? Um, I will start by saying this. So in 2000, uh, in the United States, we had a very different situation. We had an, uh, an election where there are these extraordinary circumstances um, including that the election was extraordinarily close. It was sort of unbelievably close how the election was. It came down to one state, Florida, and um, in the millions of people who voted in Florida, the difference between the candidates' votes were a few hundred votes. So it was extraordinarily close. Um, the election officials in Florida also were having an extraordinarily difficult time doing their jobs. None of this is true in the 2020 election. It could have been, but it just wasn't. Those aren't the facts that we're seeing. Um, now, if we go back to 2000, one thing that happened there was um, that the election was between George Bush and Al Gore. And Al Gore conceded. He offered his concession the night of the election, but then he ended up taking it back when he realized just how close it was. And so in light of that example from 2000, um, it is more accepted that a candidate will um, refuse to give an, accept, give to an ex, uh, concession until it is very, very clear as a matter of law who has won the election. So based on that framework, you might think that what President Trump is doing is normal. 
It's not, and the reason why it's not normal is because at this point it is abundantly clear as a matter of law who has won this election. Um, that being said, I have to imagine that one of the reasons why President Trump thinks that this is a good idea and thinks that it makes sense to bring a lot of lawsuits is because he has this idea after 2000 that somehow if you refuse to concede and bring lawsuits that might be able to change the outcome. That's just not correct. It's not what happened in 2000 um, and it's not what's happening right now. Yeah, almost everybody expects that Biden will be sworn in as president on January the 20th next year. The only way that won't happen is if our laws break down and our, and yes. our laws do not hold. Yeah, and then we will have a very difficult time in this country. Yeah. Okay. So if 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 he's that unique, why he attract a lot of voters? So it maybe you could elaborate this with with the left wings, right wings, and why why he won't in remote areas? Could you explain to all of us about that? Because here, here's here's the thing. For for us Indonesians, like Americans, they are all liberals in the eye of Indonesians. So could you, could you explain more about that? Well, I don't know. Some, some people like his personality. They really do. Uh, they don't care about ideology. They just like he's a tough man and he, he acts strong. So there are always some people in any country who like a strong man. And then there are some people who are afraid that the Democratic Party, even though Mo Biden is moderate, they're afraid that uh, the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party will have too much power and will be socialist, whatever that means, and will do bad things or that it will hurt the economy. Uh, honestly, I think another issue is that some of the people who voted for Trump are uh, European American white people who don't like the fact that America is becoming more and more diverse with not only so many African American people, but uh, people from Latin Americans and Spanish speaking families and people from everywhere in Asia, and we are becoming more and more a diverse country. In my view, that's beautiful and wonderful, but many people don't like it because it's change. So there are lots of reasons that people vote for Trump. Yeah, so so that what what um, what Professor Spitzer is saying it it makes sense to me. That being said, um, in part because of your question before about you know are are you sitting there in a blue state and sort of is your view of this um, skewed by your own political perspective? I'm actually not going to offer an answer to that question um, because you're not. This is not a legal question, right? So why do some people want to vote for President Trump? Why are they supporting him? Um, that's not a legal question. It's an important question, but it's not a question of law. Um, and so uh, I guess from my perspective is what I'm saying is kind of regardless of what those forces are, regardless of the preferences and the explanations behind them, at this point in time, the laws of the United States are under some strain because on the one hand, it's very clear what the laws require at this point. And on the other hand, we do have some resistance to um, the outcome, which is to say uh, uh, Joe Biden becoming president in January. That's a very helpful observation, Professor Nan. <laughs> Okay, now, now it's time to go back to legal question. So uh, I have a question in the chat box. It's about the, um, the electors. We, we talked about this briefly uh, before. So do, do the electors have a, an obligation to vote uh, for their presidential candidate? And if they don't have the obligation, why? Why is that? Why it's like, why it's like, a, I'm, like a lottery? I mean, if you, you, you make a pledge and then you don't have any obligation in uh, some states and then it's not the crime or it's just misdemeanor, why the system is designed like that? It's a, it's a question from Ahmad Fahmi. 
So um, that's a great question. Um, so uh, one way of thinking about the answer is uh, goes back to what Professor Spitzer was talking about, which is the history of constitutional law in this country. Um, our constitution was designed hundreds of years ago when all these different things worked differently. And because our constitution is extraordinarily, I'm using the word extraordinary a lot today, because our constitution is so difficult to amend, to change, um, that means that what we had in place 200 years ago is largely what we still have in place today. The constitution has been, has been amended 27 times in the last 200 years. Um, and so the electoral college system was set up when it made much more sense to people that, for example, the state legislatures would themselves just appoint people. And those people would then go travel or, or otherwise um, cross a long distance to get together to formally vote for a president. And maybe by that point, um, the presidential candidate had died, or maybe there was otherwise some, some problem um, that had arisen in the, in, the, in the length of time. Maybe the electors uh, would get together and decide that they thought that maybe they should vote for somebody else, given that um, you know, various forces happening here or there. It's just a different idea about how a president should be selected than what Sorry, we have now. Um, could, you speak, could you speak slowly? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, because okay. we're Indonesian, we're Indonesians, we're okay. English. Uh, okay, yeah. I will speak more slowly, and I will um, also say what I just said more quickly or uh, short, yeah. short in length. Um, the reason we have the electoral system today is because it made sense two hundred years ago and it's really hard to change our constitution. In terms of the question of what, how do the rules work, basically each state gets to decide how their electors, uh, the rules that affect their electors. So for example, in Washington state, we have a law in Washington state that does not allow an elector to violate his pledge. So if an elector in Washington state has pledged to vote for Joe Biden, then that person has to vote for Joe Biden in the electoral college. Otherwise, Washington state law will remove him and replace him with somebody who will vote for Joe Biden. In other states, they don't have these same laws. It's about half the, uh, half the states do, half the states don't. But even in the states where they don't have these laws, it's important to remember who picks the electors. The electors are picked by the political party. And so at this point, for example, if President Trump wanted to convince an elector in Pennsylvania to vote for him, he would have to convince an elector that had been selected by the Democratic Party. And it's hard to understand how that he would possibly convince somebody to do that. Okay, um, Professor Spitzer, you want you want to join? The... No, nope. oh, okay. that, that was a great answer. Maybe we can take one or two more answers, and or one or two more questions. And okay, so this is a question from uh, Putri. So uh, she asked, um, how how the the um, the Americans. Um, they govern their, so Americans uh, is, is a country with huge populations. Why? I think uh, she's asking why they opt to choose electoral college. You mentioned before uh, before that the draft of the constitution were reached, they're afraid of uh, democracy and why they are not, we know that there is now, there's a voices of changing the electoral college because that's that's not fair because the, the representation of the population is not fair. So why, why they opt for that? Could you explain about that? And how the prospect of changing that to one main one vote system, like in the state election? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, it, it is so difficult to change. 
because it's difficult to amend the constitution. There is a strong movement that a number of states have joined where the state legislatures have passed laws that say that when enough states have passed similar laws, the same kind of law, then that law, then the new law comes into effect and each state would say that it would take all of its electoral votes and they would go to the candidate who received the most votes nationally. And this would effectively uh, bring us a majority vote system if it's constitutional to do that. So maybe we will see that. And if that happens, then maybe we just amend the constitution to follow up. Professor Mannheim, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, there have been, there's been a lot of pressure to change the electoral college system. Um, but one of the reasons why it's so hard to change is precisely because it exists in the first place. So to think about it this way, to change the system, you have to get enough states or enough people, but really enough states to agree with the change. And to get enough states to agree with it, you have to get what Professor Spitzer referred to as the battleground states, the states where everybody's focused on those states for presidential elections, you need to convince those states to go along with the change. But those states kind of like the electoral college because it means that everybody's really focused on their needs and trying to attract their voters um, every presidential election. So in a sense, the fact that we have the structure that we have is what's making it so hard to change that structure. Would you agree with that, Professor Spitzer? I get that yes, yeah, yes, I think that's, because that's it's hard. not, it is not in the interest yeah. of the small population states to do away with a system that gives them extra power. Right. Okay, um, thank you. So that's also answered for Wahyu because he's also uh, asking about, about the movement. And uh, for us Indonesian, uh, that is a very interesting fact because often when we are talking about democracy, we look up uh, to the United States and um, some commentators in Indonesia even say that, hey, look, uh, even United States, they don't, they don't adopt one man, one vote. Why do we have to adopt one man, one vote in Indonesia? So that's for another discussion. So still, uh, we have um, uh, questions. Now it's, now it's from... Uh, Mustafa Fahri Bang Tope. He is also the uh, professor of constitutional law in the University of Indonesia. So if you see uh, his question, um, he said that, could you please elaborate how the presidential election runs since the beginning? How the candidate can join the primary? Is there any threshold? Like in Indonesia, the presidential threshold is, is a big issue here. So uh, let me briefly explain. If you want to uh, run as a, a presidential candidate, you have to form at least there is threshold. It's if I'm not mistaken, 20 20 percent threshold in the parliament, so you can join the primary. So you can you can you can you can your name, uh, your face could appear on the ballot. So how is it in the United States? Is there any threshold? So that's a great question, and one of the reasons why it's such a good question is because. The, unfortunately, the answer is so complicated. Um, this is gonna go to, again to the fact that we have our states run elections. Um, and so the rules governing who is on the ballot, they are gonna differ from state to state and they differ quite a bit from state to state. Um, so in a lot of states, you are gonna have thresholds, uh, but what they are, again, it varies. Um, and uh, what we nevertheless have in most states is we have um, a primary system. And, and Hugh, did you talk about the primary system already at all? A little bit? Only, only briefly, yeah, a little okay. bit. 
Um, so yeah, so basically what we do is we have, um, and again, it depends on the state. So what we have is we generally have the political parties um, basically figuring out how the election, the, the elections that occur before election day, right? So the primaries, how exactly those primaries are gonna be run that's largely dictated by not only state law, but also uh, the political party of each state. Um, and through that process, which again varies a great deal, um, we have generally one candidate that is represented, uh, that's representative of the two major political parties. Um, and then you can also have a similar sort of process going on with third parties. Um, but then that third party candidate has to make sure to follow all of the relevant laws of the state to make sure that that third party is on the ballot for the general election. Um, to further complicate things, a lot of states have different rules for the quote major parties, which translate into the Democrats and the Republicans right now, whether you're major or minor depends on how you did in the last election. So a lot of the states have different rules for the major parties than they have for the minor parties. Um, and as a result, uh, it's really just, it's, it's sort of close to impossible to summarize uh, quickly um, how exactly these rules work. The punchline yeah. is that the political parties play a very significant role in choosing who the uh, nominee is for each of the major political parties. And this year in the Democratic primary or primaries, we had perhaps 15 or 20 candidates initially trying to become the Democratic nominee. And they gradually disappeared. Uh, but when it got toward the end, there were maybe five or six. And all those candidates are going around to the different states and trying to win votes that are either open votes that everybody can vote in, or in some states, it's up to the parties and party caucuses and conventions. So it just is different in every state. It's pretty complicated. It's actually very complicated. Uh, there's a good there's a good book that just came out about this. So I'll send a link around to that in case anybody wants to look at that yeah. book. We okay. should probably just take one more question, Aristo, and then then we should we'll we'll need to go. Okay. Okay. Um so wait, most of them is um it's not a legal question. Are you are you happy to answer um legal political questions? A, a legal I'm happy question. to field any question. I don't know if I'll give sure. you the answer. <laughs> okay. So here um this is general questions. What do you think why why Joe Biden um, is winning the election? Why is that? That's, that's a, the basic question. Do you have any opinion on that? That's a, that's a political question. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you the legal answer. The legal answer is because more eligible voters cast their vote for him than in the relevant jurisdictions than for yeah. Donald Trump. Um, do you want to feel so the? Yeah, the yeah. I'll, I'll, okay. I think it's important. One more legal question. No, no, no. Let me. Yeah, but let me say something about this. Biden has six million more votes. Six million more votes than Trump. There was a very big turnout, which is wonderful. He has six million, and the margins were high enough in enough states that he was able to win. Politically, why did he win? I think it's because many people simply do not like Trump and do not like the way that he has managed the COVID-19 problem. That's what I think. Okay, um, could you answer one more legal question from uh, Risti? So uh, Sis, I don't know, he's or C, C's asking about, uh, is there any uh, exception in the US election? Exception means like in Indonesia, um, we, 
we are not federalists, but we have we are semi federalists. So in the some areas, we adopt electoral some sort of electoral college, not one man one vote system. Is there any uh, exception like that in the U.S. election system? Any unique unique exceptions? Oh, that only apply to some to uh, some states. Well, one is that in two of the states, Maine and Nebraska, the electoral votes do not of the state don't all go together to the person who got the largest number of votes. You look at each congressional district and some of the votes are based on the statewide vote, but some of the electoral uh, delegates are picked within the congressional district. So that's one thing that's different in, in Maine and Nebraska. Are there any other things, Professor Mannheim, that are significantly different? I'm not sure if this answers the question, but the United States Supreme Court has said that every jurisdiction in the country, every election in the country has to be consistent with the one man, one vote principle mm -hmm. with basically three exceptions. Um, the first exception goes to the electoral college like we're talking about. And the logic there is that the constitution may require one man, one vote, but the constitution also sets forth the electoral college. So the one man, one vote principle has to give way. Um, the second exception is in the Senate um, where you have the, and really in Congress generally, but where you have um, the, every state has two votes in this, or sorry, two representatives in the Senate, um, even though the states have wildly different populations. Um, the third exception is water districts. But everything on this, and I'm sort of throwing that out there because it's so small and weird, but everything else, you know, in a given state, the state legislature has to comply with one person, one vote. Um, the cities, uh, counties, it has, all of them have to comply with one person, one vote, except for basically the national government doesn't, and then water districts don't have to. Irrigation districts. Okay. Drainage districts, some very yeah. small agricultural districts. And the only reason I bring that up is just to confirm that in a sense, that's the exception that proves the rule yeah. outside of the US national government. So. Okay, thank you so, so much, Professor Spitzer. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, we've really enjoyed uh, talking with everybody. And you know, if people have additional questions, they can send us emails. Uh, and uh, we're happy to, to answer those in writing. They have, they have. Uh, could you, could you um, um, uh, mention your email in the chat yes. box? And I'll do that right Sorry now. Sorry for fault. Yeah, Arist Aristo, uh, I told, I told uh, uh, Mr. Jean to, uh, to come back, but uh, uh, he said uh, would, uh, he will try to, to come back. Now I will try to call him. Uh, Dr. Edmond Makarim, are you here already? The dean, the dean of the uh, University of Indonesia Faculty of Law. He's supposed to close the session. <laughs> so it seems uh, he's not here yet. So yeah, uh, I and Aristo can represent him to, on behalf of uh, our faculty uh, to say thank you very much uh, for your time, Professor uh, Spitzer and Professor Mannheim. Yeah. We really appreciate it. It's already seven o'clock in the evening, I think, of, of that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very hey, much. Hi, everyone. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I hope we, we can. Uh, we really expect, we still time. expect that we can, uh, we, we can, we can still have uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, online lectures in the future, if you great. don't mind. <laughs> It'd be great. I really enjoy it. Okay, Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have a good night for you, and thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, mohon maaf yang belum sempat dibacakan.
karena perbedaan jam yang cukup. thank you prof makasih pak Aristo penuh ya terima kasih semua atas partisipasinya Terima kasih Pak Novisa. Terima kasih Pak Novisa. Terima kasih. Nanti link link YouTube-nya bisa kita share. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Ya, oke. Terima kasih. Selamat siang. Selamat pagi semua. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Novisa. Begini.